Hey, this is Amy, Micro Minded. Um, this is a first attempt at what I will call behind the tweet. So a lot of times I tweet something and there's a lot of reasons why I tweet it and I cannot fit those reasons into the 280 characters on Twitter. So um, I wanna talk about the last tweet I put up. I talk about pathobionts and you might say, why do you have to create or not create? Why do you have to use? Yet another term that sounds kind of complicated in this whole mix of um, infection. And the reason is, is because I think it's a really important term that I've seen people use recently with success. And I think it's a term that we need to adapt. And what it really means to me or what it refers to is the fact that most microbes that persist in our human microbiome communities, and these are microbes that we know persist in communities, not just in the gut, but in communities, in blood, in tissue, in most areas of the human body. Most of them are capable of sometimes acting as commensals or essentially microbes that form part of these communities and don't seem to drive symptoms or drive anything that may be hurting the host. And these same microbes, however, can change their gene expression often depending on the conditions of the communities in which they persist, the state of the host immune system, and many other factors. They can change their gene expression and they can begin to act as pathogens. And that is, uh, that's a challenge to the way we talk often about microbes. Because oftentimes when I talk to people about microbes, they'll say, is it a good or a bad microbe? And I'll say, it's both. It's capable of persisting in a way that doesn't seem to hurt the host, and it may be capable of persisting in a way that could drive disease processes. And so the word pathobiont when I refer to a microbe as a pathobiont, that's a way of me saying that. I'm saying, look, this is a microbe that in some people might be very innocuous, but in some other people might be a big player in driving symptoms. So I want to give you a couple examples of that, or examples of how I see it. So I guess the way I look a little bit at pathobionts, and I think this is completely not scientifically accurate at a, at a very, you know, this is a, a layman's example, is that for a long time, I've described microbes to my friends like people. So a person is capable of a range of behavior. I'm not necessarily a good person or a bad person. Um, I'm a mix of all of that. In fact, so when you ask how I'm behaving at any given point in time, the way I'm behaving has a lot to do with the environment around me. It depends on who I'm hanging out with, the conditions of the environment you know, around me, is it stable, is it unstable? It depends on a lot of factors. So when a microbe moves into a human microbiome community, which they do, and I think it's very important to understand that in the body, most microbes are not persisting alone. When they infect us, or even if we're just born with them or they become part of our, of our microbiomes, they're persisting with the other members of the communities around them. These are other bacteria. Let's say it's a bacteria. There are other bacteria, but there's also viruses. There are fungi. There are archaea. I mean, some of the viruses are bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. So the way any one microbe in that large community of microbes is acting is going to depend on how those other microbes are acting. And there are almost an innumerable number of possibilities for how those other microbes may be acting in the conditions in the body at that time and place. One would definitely be the state of the immune system. Let's say that there are a couple pathogens already in a microbiome community and that those pathogens are surviving, which they often do, by slowing the host immune system. Now, if a new pathogen enters the community or infects the person, that pathogen is going to find it a lot easier to survive because the immune response is gonna have more trouble killing it, it's gonna have more trouble, uh, the immune system is gonna have more trouble controlling that pathogen. So that pathogen will find it easier to persist in a way that may also drive chronic symptoms. So where I'm getting with this is that in any condition that's tied to microbiome imbalance or dysbiosis or persistent infection, the symptoms that any one person develops over time may not just be due to one microbe and its activity, but may be due to the way an entire microbiome community has evolved over time based on the activity and interactions of many members in the community. And each time a new microbe enters that community, the way the community is already acting at that time, if it's moving toward a virulent or disease-causing direction, or whether it's stable, 
will greatly influence the behavior of that new microbe or pathobion. And I think that this is important for patients to understand, and I mean physicians and scientists, because you can see some real world examples of this happening. One thing that I think is important is that for a long time, the fact that we either looked as micro at microbes as good or bad, and it still does today, has stalled the acceptance of microbes as drivers of chronic inflammatory disease. And that's because in many cases, as we know, the same pathogen or microbe is detected in someone who's healthy and also in someone who's sick. And what that has led to many times is for the research team or doctors looking at the data to throw it out. They'll say, that microbe cannot be a driver of disease in that patient because a healthy individual harbors that microbe too. Now we know that that does not have to be the case. That in that same microbe, in the person who is sick, may be acting in a completely different way based on how it's expressing its genes, then it may be acting in the person who is healthy. So the question that we should try to be addressing now is not necessarily, I mean, it's an important question, but it's not the only question. We can ask, what microbes are there? What microbes show up on our blood test? But we also have to ask, what are they doing? How are they behaving? What genes are they expressing? Are they acting as commensals? Are they acting as pathogens? How are they acting as pathogens? How are they interacting with the neighbors around them? Are they in a biofilm community? Are they part of, are they inside the cells of the immune system? Are they persisting, for example, inside a human white blood cell or are they not? We have to ask all kinds of questions and a very important question too is, are they acting in a way that can alter human gene expression, metabolism and immunity, which many, many microbes can do. So that's a key question. And it also really comes down to one more question that I want to address simply because a lot of people know that I have particular experience with the illness ME-CFS. And lately I've seen this question, of course, it's sort of one of the main questions tossed around with ME-CFS patients, is um, many patients with the illness get sick with an initial infection that does not seem to ever go away. And then chronic symptoms develop after this initial infection. Often this infection is mononucleosis, but really it can be a range of different infections. And the person gets sick and they never really fully seem to recover. Um, so a lot I've seen lately a mention that maybe the reason why a, let's say it's Epstein-Barr virus, mononucleosis. I've seen people say that maybe the reason why Epstein-Barr virus would persist um, and cause symptoms in a person with ME-CFS would be because of some problem with their human genome. And I'm not saying that can't be the case, but I think a more likely explanation is that because in someone who gets infected with Epstein-Barr virus, whether the virus persists, whether the virus drives chronic symptoms, whether the virus is able to persist inside the cells of the immune system, whether it can cause damage or whether the immune system can keep it under control will depend on the mix of other pathogens and microbes in that person's microbiome communities. It will depend on the state of that person's immune system at the time of the infection. So if the immune system is compromised by any kind of variable, there are so many, by chemicals, by other environmental factors, that may keep the pathogen, may create an atmosphere in which the pathogen can better persist. But really, what I am most interested in is how the other microbes in a community influence how a pathogen can persist remain and drive chronic symptoms. And I'll give you one example of that in a study I'll post after I do this. For example, in HIV, which is a condition that's pretty easy to understand when it comes to infection, we have a virus that drives a very dis discernible disease that has chronic symptoms. What a couple of research teams have found is that composition of the vaginal microbiome. So all the different bacteria, well, they've mostly looked at bacteria, but I'm assuming bacteria, viruses, fungi, archaea, whatever microbes are present in the vaginal microbiome at the time of infection, if a woman is exposed to HIV through sexual intercourse, that can determine whether HIV remains and persists in that woman. So essentially, HIV risk, whether that virus will remain with a woman and cause the disease HIV AIDS, depends, appears to, from early preliminary data, depends to hinge a lot on the other microbes in the vaginal microbiome community at the time of exposure.
So I think we need to pursue this with many other pathogens and better understand how community microbiome dynamics affects their ability to persist and drive disease processes. All right, that's enough for today. Thanks. Bye.